Good welcome everybody to Grass College. My name is Naomi Houseman, and it's my privilege to, to lead institutional advancement at Grass College. Thanks to all of you for being here, both in person and also online. We have many people joining us online today. Um, today is the biennial Arnold and Esther Cousin Memorial Holocaust Teachers. I'm going to take a moment to make sure I get all that right. Um, so I just want to say a few words about this special day and this program and get this program started. We have a full day of learning ahead of us. So first, a special welcome to not just all of you, but also especially to all of our students who are joining us from all corners of the world, our faculty as well. I'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, the folks who helped to make this day possible, our hardworking institutional advancement team, our IT team, we've got a lot of technology sort of moving behind the scenes here. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. So thank you to them. And uh, just a quick note about technology, since we're talking about that. This whole day of the program is being recorded. You'll see there's a green orb of light above you. Those are microphones. So we ask that you sort of keep the sound a little bit to a minimum because all of the, they're very sensitive mics and all the sound is being heard in the recording and also for those who are joining us online. So we will take questions um, throughout the program and we'll sort of give you the cue for when is that moment to raise, to ask, raise your hand and ask a question. Um, and also those who are online will be able to put questions in the Q&A tool on their Zoom tour. So we'll be monitoring those as well. So on behalf of the college, I'd like to thank all the generations of the Tusman family, wonderful Tusman family, that it, many of them are here today. The Holocaust teaching is a realization of the vision of the late Arnold and Esther Tusman. It is due to their generosity that Grass is able to host this powerful day of learning for the past 12 years now. And through that, we have reached thousands and thousands of people across the world with quality Holocaust education. We are proud that today's program, Battling Indifference, How We Teach the Holocaust, will provide yet another exceptional day of learning. So with that said, please join me now in welcoming Marty Tesman on behalf of the whole Tesman family who will be sharing some reflections with us today. Welcome, Marty. We've arrived. We're here today to be good to see. We are in person now after the pandemic. First time together for a while. We have it both live and online. We have it for so many to share thereafter in hours of their convenience in their homes. Yeah, um, we're hearing the challenges and complexities that we face today. There are great, they are great, and they are many. Now we look forward to the learning that we have ahead of us today. Yeah, yeah. I'm here with a really heavy heart today as we watch the world seeming to slip into ways that I have not seen for many years. I came to age in the 60s. I fought for social justice and civil rights, celebrated our first Earth Day. I watched as Roe became law and when rights for sexual preference of people with disabilities were achieved. The times, they were changing. Or seem to be. I watched our society, much of the world, transition to become more abrasive and inclusive, developing tolerance and accepting difference and diversity. And yet, today, again, and truly, maybe always, we have battled with differences. Today, here and now, we battle with indifference. And the fear of how much of our society and world is slipping back to a less tolerant world. And I look back now at what seems to be my naivete. Indeed, I have a heavy heart as the news of Kyrie Irving and Kanye West is in our media. And my concerns for what Elon Musk describes as free speech, maybe hate speech being echoed and amplified in ways that we've seen before. Here we are on the eve of Kristallnacht, as all synagogues and many black churches in the country have added security. 
And we heard only last week of a very credible threat posed now to synagogues in New Jersey. Today, we watch countries around the world and most loudly and visibly in the Ukraine as pits of buried bodies are discovered. It echoes back to the powerful presentation at the Tasman teaching by Father Dubois delivered to us years ago about the silence of murder, mass shootings and burial pits as a cheap and efficient genocide. Through all this, I suffer PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as I watch scenes on CNN today. The world was quiet 80 years ago as there were bodies similarly on the streets of Kiev or Kherson or my parents' villages that I visited just a couple months ago. And we've recently heard from Ken Burns' documentary addressing the indifference illustrated in the world and the US as we saw the Holocaust unfold and in many ways chose to keep our eyes closed. Is it post-traumatic? Is it in our past? How much are we recalling Aryan nationalism now while we witness white nationalism or Polish nationalism or Hungarian or Turkish nationalism or is Islamic fundamentalism being rekindled now, being kindled now? Today, we see the plight of women fighting persecution in Iran or Syrian refugees where the great persecution and suffering in Haiti Afghanistan, Venezuela, we can go on and name the list. Today, I just looked on Wikipedia about Holocausts before 1914, after 1945. Battling indifference, what are the actions we can take? How do we live in this world? As we approach Kristallnacht, we consider all the times and ways that things preceded Kristallnacht. Only this weekend, my wife Eileen and I saw two plays in New York, Parade and Leopoldstadt. And they're so appropriate to the dialogue this weekend before Kristallnacht. Sadly, they take place in different times and parts of the world, but they tell the same story. Parade about the environment of anti-Semitism and racism in the South, and ultimately the lynching of Leo Frank in 1915. And of course, that launched the work of the Anti-Defamation League, and we'll hear from Randy Boyette shortly. And the ADL has battled the indifference to anti-Semitism and persecution ever since and still today. Leo Frank was the only Jew to be lynched in the South. But unfortunately, that fate was suffered by countless Blacks in the South whose stories were untold and numbers not known as racism and hatred filled much of the environment of the United States. And I said that in a past tense. And we question how much that's present today. And Leopoldstadt, the story of the playwright's family in Vienna that dates from the late 1800s, suffering anti-Semitism and struggling with its assimilation and the world's indifference that preceded Kristallnacht as the playwright comes to terms with his own avoidance and indifference to his Jewish identity and his Jewish history. How do we battle indifference? How do we fight for a vigil, vigilant world? I taught about the Holocaust in a Catholic school last week to sixth graders and the sixth graders were full of questions, burning questions for them and burning for us all. What could a German do if they didn't want to kill a Jew? They asked. Why wasn't the rest of the world helping the Jews? How did your parents feel that nobody was helping? How could people stand by and watch? We ended the class with half the hands in the room still up in the air. Here we are today. 
I'm so grateful to have Randy Boyette here as we herald, especially the deal that was brokered between Kyrie Irving and the Nets, creating a million dollar fund supporting education on anti Semitism and racism, community involvement and education, and bringing the communities together in Brooklyn in areas of significant anti Semitic threat and racial tension. And I'm honored to have Erwin Cutler join us today from the Raoul Wallenberg Center. And I read the most powerful quote many times in my life that one person with the courage to care and the commitment to act can confront evil and transform history. And I say that again to all those on Zoom and all those kids that will watch this program in the future. One person with the courage to care and the commitment to act can confront evil and transform history. And I'm so grateful to have your participation, Alicia, maintaining the legacy and the power of your dad's work as you continue to fight for justice and persecuted communities around the world. Jackie it's our job here today and for perpetuity to ask the questions. It's our job to teach, to listen, and to learn. It's our job to continue to do everything we can to impact change. Thank you all for being here today. Jackie I'm Sam Ellis, president of Grass College. And like the family houseman, I offer our sincere thanks to the entire Kelsey family. Marty and, and a quick thing to uh, add Michelle's uh, parents, Esther and Arnold, were one of the first to recognize Grass's role in elevating Holocaust education at our college and recognize our college's leadership in the continuous effort to combat it. The Tuzman Memorial Holocaust teaching is usually scheduled near the anniversary of Kristallnacht, as it is this year. This is a marquee program within Graz College's Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights. I extend my gratitude as well to Naomi Houseman, as she indicated, and to many others at Graz College who architected and supported today's multifaceted, hybrid, multi technological program. Today's event is emblematic of the range and reach of our center. Our panel on battling indifference, how we teach the Holocaust, draws from the legacy of one of the Jewish people's most pivotal ambassadors to the arena of peace and of freedom. Elie Wiesel championed the dual effort of Holocaust education to learn about and to learn from the Holocaust. On the present panel are three individuals who have learned very directly from Elisa and share in that powerful dual vision. As Elisa aptly put it, how to combat the perils of indifference. It's my beautiful pleasure to introduce our keynote panel today. Elisa Wiesel first is chairman of the Elisa Wiesel Foundation for Humanity in his most recent board position at Good Shepherd Services, Alicia raised millions of dollars for New York's neediest by convening Midnight Madness, where hundreds of finance professionals stayed up all night solving elaborate puzzles in the city streets. When his father passed away in 2016, Alicia realized how many others missed his voice, as do I. And so, when opportunities for impact arise, Alicia shares his father's message and continues his legacy by standing up for persecuted communities. For example, in the last few years, Alicia has spoken at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum about the need to protect the LGBTQ community and show the bright light while speaking at Auschwitz on the plight of Syrian refugees being denied Western asylum. Erwin Cobbler is the international chair of the Uru Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada and longtime member of Parliament. Professor Cobbler recently held the Isaacman Distinguished Visiting Professor in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Gratz College and is Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University. As Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Professor Cobbler initiated the first ever comprehensive reform of the Supreme Court appointment process 
and help make it the most gender represented Supreme Court in the world. Finally, our moderator, Mandy Boyette, is a Senior Associate Regional Director of Education for the Anti-Defamation League. She has served as the ADL Education Director in Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey, and Delaware since 2003. Boyette is the co-author of Let It Burn, a book about the organization MOVE in the city of Philadelphia. Born, raised, and educated in Philadelphia, Boyette holds a bachelor's degree in history from Temple University and a master's degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Gratz College. Mandy and the ADL are longtime partners with Gratz College. Her efforts to combat hate and indifference is an inspiration and further motivation. With tremendous gratitude, Mandy, I hand over our keynote presentation to your trusted hands. Wonderful to see you all. It's so great to see the two of you on the screen. Wish you were here with us. Wow. I have so many questions for both of you. And we need to leave time for folks here and online to ask questions. But as a person who cares deeply about Holocaust education and thinking about when we teach our children this really difficult history, Alicia, I was wondering how old you were when you or your parents told you about their experiences before, during, and after the war, and um, whether they initiated the conversation or whether you did. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this discussion, and thank you to Gratz College for hosting myself and Erwin, where I'm personally really, really appreciative of the chance to speak to all of you today. Uh, I think my earliest memory might have been around age four, sitting in my father's lap in his study on Central Park West. Uh, he had a manual typewriter, and he was actually a uh, hunt and peck typist, believe it or not. I don't know how he got through so many manuscripts, but I remember sitting on his lap as he was working, which he would let me do. And there was one photograph that he took with him to every office he ever occupied. And that was a black and white photograph taken in the 1950s of his childhood home in Seaget. And it's a dark foreboding photograph. It's taken on a gray day. Um, you know, it, it, Seaget was not a, a charming place in that particular moment. And I remember asking my father, what is that place? And he said, it's where I grew up. And I asked him if I had had grandparents there. And he said, something very bad happened to everyone in our family. And that was about as much as I heard. The rest really was picked up in a more ambient fashion. Uh, as I grew older, ages eight, nine, 10, I remember kids, you know, we would talk in the playground. What does your dad do? Oh, my dad, he was an Air Force pilot in the Israeli Air Force. And now he flies planes for El Al. Well, my dad is a pharmacist. He saves people. And I'd say, I think my dad saw something really terrible happen. And now he teaches. But that's about as much as I understood. And then really in an ambient process, when my friends would go to Palm Beach or the Hamptons for their breaks, and I'd be heading off to Auschwitz as a president, part of the presidential commission sponsored by Carter, slowly, slowly, I started to put together what the story was that had happened to my family. Thanks, Alicia. And Professor Fowler, I know that you have a long history with Ellie Wiesel, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, what that relationship was like. First, let me just uh, uh, echo Elisa's words about uh, pleasure to, to be here, uh, to have you, Randy, as moderator, Gretz College as, as host in this very timely and uh, significant forum. Uh, I have to say that uh, Elie Wiesel was, uh, for me, a uh, other than uh, my parents, the, the most important teacher, educator, mentor, uh, role model that I had. What I learned about the profundity of the Holocaust. And when I say that, both in terms of the particularity of the horrors of the Holocaust and the universality of the lessons I learned from Elie Wiesel. I had initial exposure. I was reminded when I heard Alicia's words, uh, I first had an exposure to it at the age of five. Uh, I, I say this because I was born on May 8th, 1940. May 8th, 1945 was VE Day in Europe. So that was my first and most celebratory birthday. Indeed, I was celebrating, you know, an international uh, 
birthday in terms of VE day. But I then learned shortly thereafter about what had been happening from the time I was born to 1945. I learned about horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. I learned, as Ali Wiesel put it so pointedly and profoundly, that the Holocaust was a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. I learned about the dangers of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity and genocide. I think what one of the more profound of the lessons that Elie Wiesel has taught us that what made the Holocaust and the genocides that followed, I, and as Elie would always put it, I make no comparisons between those genocides and the Holocaust. But what made the genocide of the Tutsis and other genocides that followed so horrific were not only the horrors themselves, that was bad enough. What made them so horrific is that the Holocaust and the genocide were preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. And I'll close by saying that uh, just as I learned what happened between 1940 and 1945, and my birthday afterwards, I then learned about what happened before 1940. I learned that Kristallnacht did not happen by accident, that Dachau, the first concentration camp, was built in 1933, that the Nuremberg race laws were enacted in 1935, that the state sanctioned inci incitement to hate and genocide, as Elie Wiesel described it uh, so well, was ongoing from 33 to Kristallnacht. So Kristallnacht did not happen by accident. It was the indifference, the inaction of the bystander community that made it possible. Thank you, Professor. So I had the honor of hearing Elie Wiesel speak when my former boss, Abe Foxman, retired in July. 2015, and he said something that I'll never forget because of what he said, but also because of how pained he seemed when he said it. He said that when he was in Auschwitz, he and his fellow internees truly believed that if the Americans knew what was happening to them, they would come to their rescue. And he said that when, they, that when he came to this country after the war, he found out, in fact, that folks did know what was going on and didn't come to their rescue. He was brokenhearted. And I was reminded of that was when I was watching the Ken Burns documentary that Marty was talking about. And I was wondering what messages your dad gave you about the United States. And Professor Power, if uh, Elie Wiesel said anything to you about his feelings about the United States and what we did and didn't do. And I say this knowing that if we had not entered the war, it would have been worse. And, and, and we sacrificed a lot, of, a lot of our soldiers and we fought that war. But as we all know, I think we would agree we could have done more. And I'm wondering what your dad had to say about it and your friend, Professor Potter. Sure, um, I'll go first. I, I have a lot to say, so please cut me off if I go too long to keep the, to keep the thing moving. Um, first of all, I should say that, you know, it's interesting to hear about Erwin, your birthday story. So I was born on D-Day and uh, my father was an incredible, incredible, I don't think he planned that, but my father was an incredible patriot of this country. And I'm gonna share uh, two things, one in response to Ken Burns, which you mentioned, and then the second about my father as a patriotic American. So with regards to Ken Burns, I think what's really interesting here is not what my father said, although my father was critical of FDR um, not having done more. My father often said that for bombs to fall on Auschwitz, even if it would have killed inmates, the mere sign that they were not alone would have been worth it to know that the world cared. And it's a viewpoint I often heard him express. But I think more interestingly is what my father did as a result of one of the things in the Ken Burns film. And the Ken Burns film does not spend, I think, a ton of time on this. It does touch on it. But Peter Bergson, Hillel Cook, you have to realize, was perceived as a troublemaker, a rabble rouser. Stephen Wise was not happy with Peter Bergson for wanting to keep pushing and pushing and put ad after ad in the New York Times every single day, highlighting the atrocities that were occurring in Europe. And I think that when my father in the 1960s, after he returned from the Soviet Union in 1965, having written The Jews of Silence, 
there, there was also a crossroads. There were many in the organized Jewish community, um, including some very you know, meritorious and, and worthwhile individuals who all told my father, listen, it's best to do things behind closed doors the way Rabbi Wise wanted to do with FDR. It's better to let these things play out. We'll get a few out. And my father said, we're taking it to the students. And he and a few others, and ultimately Sharansky in the next decade, took a movement to the students and ignited a fire that ultimately culminated in Freedom Sunday and got international attention. And I think in no small way contributed to the fall of the Iron Curtain on a much broader basis. So that's what my father did, not what he said, it's what he did in response to what happened with Hillel Cook and Rabbi Stephen Wise. The last thing I wanna mention about my father as an American before I turn it over to hear what my dear friend Erwin has to say um, is my father was a patriotic American to the point that it's the only time I can actually remember my father getting angry at me. And that was my freshman year of college. I had returned to the Thanksgiving dinner table full of you know, many liberal ideas. And it was at a time when the Bush senior court was debating whether or not it should be against the, the law to burn the United States flag. And I remember sitting down and I'm saying, oh, this is such a terrible idea. You know, the only thing more important than the flag is this free speech that stands behind it. Of course, it should be okay to burn the flag. And my father gave me the darkest look I think I will ever remember him giving me. And he pushed back his chair a little bit and he stood up and he said, you have no idea what that flag meant to those of us rescued at Buchenwald that day. That flag under which we saw soldiers arrive, crying, having lost their brothers in arms to get to the point where they could save us. For you to say something like that, let me never hear it again said in my presence. I'll hand it over to you, Ron. It's interesting what you just mentioned, Alicia. My first point of interaction with your father had to do in the immediate aftermath of the Jews of Silence, of the writing of that book. And I remember uh, how he was referencing it, that he was speaking not about the Jews of the former Soviet Union when he was speaking about the Jews of silence. He was speaking about the Jews of the United States and, and Canada. In other words, that it was our responsibility to speak up and act on behalf of a Soviet jury. And it was Eli who galvanized the world movement for Soviet jury, the struggle uh, for Soviet Jewry. I was a student at the time and I was part of the movement that developed at McGill University and, and in Montreal, but we were all inspired by Ellie who came and visited us. He had family in, in, in Montreal and the Jews of silence were part of that larger message that he would always keep repeating. Uh, the, the notion that indifference always means coming down on the side of the victimizer not on the side of the victim. And our responsibility at all times to speak up and to act in the face of injustice. Soviet jury was a watershed moment uh, for me and my peers. And it was Ellie who, as I say, uh, inspired us in that struggle and in so many others. And in fact, the battling indifference, which is a the theme of today's Gretz College, is, is really what, Elie Wiesel's life and education and impact was all about. And that's why when we uh, founded the Raoul Wallenberg Center, I don't know how well it's known that Ellie co-founded the Raoul Wallenberg Center in Canada with me. He was our first honorary co-chair from the US. And the Wallenberg Center grew out of the responsibility to combat indifference. The Burns documentary, while it spoke about for example, the manner in which uh, Jews were so poorly allowed to enter the U.S. never referenced the fact that the worst country with respect to keeping out Jews in the Second World, in the run-up to the Holocaust, was Canada, which uh, in, in fact inspired the book by my colleagues Irving Abella and S. Troper called None is Too Many, which were the words of a civil servant with respect to uh, the admission of Jews uh, to Canada from 33 to 40, none is too many. The actual manifestation uh, in its gross and cruel form of what indifference and inaction was all about and what it could lead to. So 
Ellie was the lodestar with respect to showing us the importance of battling indifference and acting to combat it. Thank you so much. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, your dad's relationship with God. In his book, Memoirs, published in 95, he wrote, Alex was this conceivable neither with God or without him, perhaps saying that I may come to understand man's role in the mystery Auschwitz represents, but never God's. I'll never cease to rebel against those who committed or permitted Auschwitz, including God. The questions I once asked myself about God's silence remain open. So he wrote that in 95 or maybe before. Um, I'm wondering whether those questions remained open to him and how did his relationship with God inform your own? And Professor Cotter, you and um, Ellie had conversations about that as well. I'd be very interested to know your perspective. Is that first for Erwin or for myself? You can start since you were, you know, I'm sure he was very big on um, imparting Jewish values and his, uh, maybe his theology to you. Yeah, I would say, again, I'm going to focus more on what my father did than anything he said. Uh, I always think actions speak louder than words. And it's funny, you know, my mother, I think, had a similar complaint about my father that my wife now has about me since I've had children and my father passed. Uh, which is that there's this thing called creeping Judaism. And I think that when my father married my mother, you know, he at that point was a somewhat secularized Jew, not completely secularized, but, you know, extremely well integrated, uh, not visibly observant, I think, in the way that um, he became later in his life. And I think that as I was born, as he started feeling the pull of years, he intensified his observance. I don't think he ever stopped believing in God. He always had a lifelong argument with God, a debate with God. He was too close to God to just give him up, but I think, or her. But I think that, you know, my father, as he, as he progressed throughout life, increasingly <laughs> turned more and more to the study of his ancient texts that had never left him, but he reimmersed himself more and more deeply. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes that my father said, now coming to something he said, uh, is, you know, just because I'm angry at God, why should I take it out on Shabbos? <laughs> I love that quote. I love that quote. <laughs> because my father truly, truly loved Shabbos. And, you know, for him, that was a time to just disconnect, to daven, to put all of the craziness of the world that he dealt with six days a week and to put it on hold and immerse himself Um I only wish that I had discovered Shabbos early enough to really enjoy it with him. Thank you. Professor yeah, Again, you know, it's Alicia's words that uh, spawn remembrances for me uh, when he referenced about uh, Ellie's uh, lifelong argument with God. I think one of the most profound lectures that I ever heard Ellie Wiesel give was actually at the University of uh, Toronto. And this goes back again, you know, to the late 60s and early 70s. I heard it twice uh, when he spoke about Akedat Yitzchak. And there you, you really see Eli grappling uh, with God, if you will, but always with that sense of mystery and profundity and respect. And it was uh, an, an incredible, it's, it's almost impossible to, to share the, uh, as I say, uh, that kind of conveyance uh, that when we all left that lecture, uh, interestingly enough, while it was in terms of metaphorically and uh, about an argument with God message wise, we all came away more profoundly committed to our Judaism and to the need to go back to text, to study, to read and, and to learn. And so I, I, I think in that even my own life has been paralleling that as well. <laughs> exactly what Alicia said, I would have called myself a secularized Jew. I, I married a, uh, a woman who was Orthodox and uh, there too, I began to move in the same uh, direction, certainly uh, with regard uh, to Shabbat. So there are a lot of parallels, I, you know, I could just sit here and just listen to Alicia because it, 
it is so evocative of the remembrances and the teachings of his father that any time he speaks, uh, it just, as I said, evokes for me a timely and significant remembrance, but a remembrance that had an impact on my life. Well, both of you are truly a gift to those of us who, you know, have read your dad's work, Ellie's work, and um, and really care about his legacy. So I want to switch gears to Holocaust education for a little bit. It's often been said that the Holocaust can be seen through a universal lens or a particularist lens. And I've heard Ellie Wiesel be lauded for advancing the universal messages of the Holocaust, but I've also read through the years that you're that your father, your friend, was concerned about the Jewish experience being lost in a universal message. So can you tell us more about how he felt about it, how you both feel about this idea of this balance? Listen, uh, by the way, Aaron, if you want to go, it doesn't always have to be that I go first. I'm happy for you to go first, and then I can respond to what you have to say. Would you like well, to go first the time? I, actually, when, when you go first, I find it helps to... <laughs> refine what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I'm going to... I'll, keep, I'll keep going. Look, I think my father was, um, he embraced this paradox. He, he said, there is no paradox. It's not this choice. It's a false dichotomy. I don't have to choose between being a humanist and between being a proud, observant Jew. Uh, for him, they were the same. Because he was a Jew, because he was so deeply connected to where he came from. He had the ability to, to give of his talents and his gifts and care about the whole world. And because he was plugged in to the world, it made him a more complete Jew. There was no paradox for him. It was, it was all one and the same. But I do find that, you know, with six years gone since my father's passing, I find as someone who is, is fighting for his legacy, that there is a risk that my father is remembered only for the humanist that he was, that he is remembered as a grand stage on the, you know, a grand figure on the world stage, um, dealing with so many different crises, and that who he was and where he came from and what were the beliefs he held so dear, that all of that is, is not given the same treatment. And I remember when um, you know, we were we were very blessed, the 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 Dean of the um, of the Washington National Cathedral was kind enough to fight hard that my father should have a sculpture, a bust put into the, the National Cathedral to be remembered as a great American. Of course, I'm worried. My father, a Jew inside a church, what's he going to think, you know, if he knew about this? And believe it or not, they were very accommodating. We came up with a, a halakhic adjustment where they took a, they took a, they put a blemish into the sculpture so it wouldn't be a, a full likeness. But more importantly was my concern when we were designing that ceremony that my father needed to be remembered for exactly what he was and not just a general person on the stage, but also deeply committed observant Jew. And by the way, something that's not as popular to say these days as a Zionist, a proud Zionist, someone who deeply, deeply believed that the state of Israel needed to exist so that the Jewish people would never again have our backs up against the wall with nowhere to go and the world turned against us. So I find often that in a, in a, in a time and era where sadly the word Zionist has become an attack rather than something we say with pride, um, you know, my father was that as well. So I do find the particular of his nature is in danger of being forgotten. Yeah, I always found that Ali Wiesel would speak when he spoke of the Holocaust, both of the particularity of the horrors of the Holocaust and the universality of its lessons. There was no contradiction and there was no uh, uh, paradox, as Alicia mentioned. I always, always remember a, a particular teaching. Uh, again, I, I, I sometimes feel that everything I've learned and said it came from Ellie in one form or another, when he would speak of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil and anti-Semitism as a paradigm for radical hate, and that the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, was really metaphor and message of, of both, uh, that 1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. And I think the important lesson that Ellie taught us about it is that Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism itself did not die in Auschwitz. And that it remains the canary in the mineshaft of global evil today. And 
he patented that which is always repeated by others, but not only patented, but could teach it and educate about it, that while it begins with Jews, it doesn't end with Jews, and was able to link the particular and the universal. And I think that was the in, in incredulity of his teachings, the profundity of those teachings on both levels. He was the most profound exponent of understanding that the Holocaust, as I mentioned earlier, was a, a war against the Jews, in which not all Jews, in which uh, not all those who were killed, well, sorry, a war against the Jews in, in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. But he then were able to extrapolate from that, you know, the universality of the lessons of the Holocaust, which were with respect to the dangers of indifference and inaction and the imperative of acting. That is why Raoul Wallenberg was such an important figure in that regard, because as mentioned earlier, he demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act and confront evil and transform history. Thank you. So we're going to talk about anti-Semitism, but I want to take a break and take some questions from the audience, maybe like three, and then we'll go back and we'll save time for more questions. So anybody have a question they want to ask? Yes. Um, my name is Jeffrey Daycro. I am <laughs> astonished and just deeply saddened that in the face of the election in Israel last week, that not a word has been mentioned about the possibility becoming an increasing pos probability that Israel itself is about to manifest some of the very early behaviors that have been registered and, descri and described here along with the train, the litany of other genocides. Is it not reasonable and necessary for us to turn our eyes towards our own community? Alicia, Professor, I, I, it's nice and spicy and I love nice and spicy. So I'm happy to take yeah. that one first. Go for it, Alicia. <laughs> yeah, look, I think, you know, we could talk Israeli politics for three hours straight. Um, you know, I think, incoming Prime Minister Netanyahu made whatever uh, allegiances he needed to make in order to get back into office. I think we have to see whether or not he's able to control uh, this troubling far right wing that um, that has helped put him into power, specifically Ben Gvir, and then to a lesser extent, but still concerning Smotrich. Um, look, I think that you know Israel has to decide its fate. It has a free population. It has a, uh, an electorate. It's going to make its decisions. If at some point we actually see, you know, you said that uh, it's about to, to join these genocidal actions. Look, if we see a government take actions that we think are genocidal, God forbid, uh, I assure you that, you know, I would say something and I assume others would as well. But I think we're, we're quite a distance from that. And thank God Israel is a free democracy to make its choices. I think that the left um, miscalculated on a few fronts. I think that they could have had done, done a much better showing here had they been more united. Um, there's a lot of you know, backseat quarterbacking we can we can do on that front. So the question that you ask, though, I think at its fundamental level is, is it appropriate for American Jews or for diaspora Jews in general to criticize Israel? And I think that it's a, it's a question we have to be very thoughtful on. And I want to share where my father was on that very specific question. So my father, as a general matter, made a very early decision in his career that he was not going to criticize Israel. And the reason that he made that decision is he felt that, first of all, he felt a tremendous amount of gratitude to the state of Israel for existing. He knew that if the world would ever again threaten its Jews, it was a place that we could all go. He also felt that it was not his place because it was not his blood or his children's blood that were going to be spilled in its wars or as the victims of terrorism. It wasn't his money that was going to pay its taxes. And he felt in general, the best people in the world to decide how to adopt a posture between security 
and extending its arms in peace were the people who lived there, were the people whose lives were actually on the line if a miscalculation were to occur either way. If the miscalculation was to be to too much security and thus squander the chance of peace, condemning future generations to have an, a state of being prepared for war, or whether is in the direction of, of overextending arms in peace and, and giving away territory. And by the way, my father watched very, very carefully what happened with Ariel Sharon's plan to give up Gaza in 2006, and what happened when you had missiles you know, within distance of Israeli cities being allowed to, to exist. So I don't think that there are any easy answers here. If the government of the state of Israel engages as a government in behavior that I think crosses a line, I will say something. Do I think by and large that we live in a world where Israel is regularly on the wrong side of that line? No, and I actually think if anything, we live in a world where the international press condemns Israel and holds it to an impossibly high standard that no other country in the world has ever been held to. Thank you, Alicia, Professor. Yeah, I, I just think that with all that is happening in the world and what has been happening um, in Israel, I think Ellie's voice is needed more uh, than ever. Uh, I was reminded of this because, and I share everything that Alicia said, but what has been going on now for months in Israel have been regular daily terrorist attacks. Uh, we, we hear about uh, when those terrorist attacks are uh, unfortunately successful, we don't hear about the number that have been thwarted. I say that because I think what was a major issue in this past election was the issue of personal security. I think that the terrorist attacks brought about a movement uh, that Netanyahu was able to leverage with respect to the arguments for the need for security and that the governments and, and uh, uh, the Shinui government of change was not providing that uh, security. And it reminds me of something that differentiates between those of us who are living uh, here and those living in Israel. I happen to have a family in, in Israel. I've got uh, two children there. I've got uh, four grandchildren there. I keep in close touch. My, my wife is Israeli, is Israeli, but I'm reminded of, a, of an incident that I think may, I hope, share light on, on why there's sometimes a disparity of understanding. In December, to be precise, December 21st, 2015, I went on a visit to Israel. Uh, I arrived and I uh, do what I normally did. I bought the newspaper Steinmatzky's at the, at the airport. And on the front page, there was a reference to terrorist attack in Ranana. My daughter lives in Ranana and I called and she said, we're, we're fine daddy, but our neighbors uh, were those that uh, were hit. 10 days later, I went to visit my son uh, living in uh, Tel Aviv. Then and as crossing Dizengoff, there was a terrorist attack on Dizengoff. I was caught up in, in the dragnet at the time. And 10 days after that, just before I left my three week visit, another terrorist attack and my cousin who was pregnant uh, was a target of, and victim of that attack, happily both she and, and the fetus survived. I say all this because I came back to Canada and I had a pre-scheduled meeting with the then uh, and now Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And he asked me, understandably, he said, so Erwin, how was your holiday? How was your Christmas and New Year's? And I said, well, you know, I was in Israel. And then I described to him what I just shared with you. And then he said to me, you know, I'm sorry, Erwin, I didn't, uh, know ab about that. I said, I understand that, Justin. I said, <laughs> here in, in Canada, you know, people were celebrating uh, Christmas and New Year's. There was almost no reference to anything that I just described to you in the media here. People didn't even know that these terrorist attacks were taking place. When Israel will retaliate, uh, then you might uh, read about it in terms of the, the nature or criminality of Israel's retaliation. But the actual ongoing daily life experiences are not that well known or understood uh, here uh, in North America, and understandably so. And I think what was happening in the run-up to the Israeli elections has been the intensified attacks and culture of incitement and rejectionism uh, that were underpinning those attacks. And when you live in Israel, uh, that has an impact uh, on you, on your family, on your sense of security. And I think that had an impact on the election. That's not to, in, in, in any way, 
uh, say, okay, we shouldn't be concerned about the outcome. You know, I have concerns about uh, the outcome, and if necessary, I will speak up if need be with regard to that. Though I understood, again, if I may say, Alicia, my wife quotes uh, your dad when I do speak up and tells me I should that there was one lesson I didn't learn. Um, so when I do speak up, but that will be something I will do if, if it needs to be done. But here again, it was a democratic election. Uh, the people spoke in a democratic election. I would have preferred another outcome. This is the outcome that we have. Uh, it's our responsibility, I think, not only to understand what is happening there, but to begin uh, to speak you know, truth to power here so that they understand better what is happening there. Thank you so much. Another question? Yes. Uh, first, thank you all three for presenting. It's very meaningful and impactful. Um, touched on briefly about American failures up to 45. I'm wondering what you see in terms of American and Canadian, United States and Canadian immigration policy since 45, at least in the United States, Representative Emanuel Seller worked for rescue, helped completely transform American immigration policy. And today his work is being challenged very broadly. I'm wondering from, from both of you, what do you see as the takeaway lessons to inform immigration and rescue policies today in both countries? Alicia, you're muted. There's, there's two parts to that. There's, you said immigration and rescue. So I'll, I'll talk about both. So first of all, as an immigrant, um, what an amazing story my father had as an immigrant. He was working here in the 1950s under a visa. He had uh, been hit by a taxi cab in Times Square and was in a body cast for weeks and weeks. And I think because of that, missed his appointment to renew the visa. So he goes to the customs office and is told by a kindly customs officer, you know, you could become a full-time citizen. Can you imagine that happening today, sort of in this, you know, environment where immigration is under such attack? Um, and thank God my father became a citizen, one of the most loyal and patriotic citizens I think this country has ever known. So my father believed deeply in immigration, that this was the country we purported to be in the plaque on the Statue of Liberty, that we did have our arms open. And beyond that, I want to start touching on rescue, because my father thought that America had a unique place in the world. My father felt that America, as the, the first and most preeminent superpower, had an ability to take moral actions that changed the world stage. And in general, my father believed that that meant leaning into action and that America with its uh, unbelievably powerful and, and, and ethical military, because my father believed that, my, that, that this country not only succeeded in terms of its might, but actually succeeded in terms of its ethics. And he was, you know, maybe to a fault, he believed this. That gave him a view that in general, if the question was for America to intervene or not to intervene, that the world was almost always better off with America intervening and therefore America was better off. And that informed his view on every aspect of foreign affairs from the beginning until the end. In terms of uh, immigration and rest, I think that uh, Canada has uh, turned around in terms of its approach to immigration. When it came to uh, the humanitarian catastrophe in Syria and the, the brutality of the uh, war in Syria, uh, Canada embarked upon a program whereby we took in 50,000 uh, Syrian refugees and have uh, continued that uh, process. Uh, similarly, with regard to uh, Afghan uh, refugees, we've set an objective here. Uh, we've not been uh, implementing it as effectively and as quickly as I would like, but an, an objective here as well with regard uh, to uh, 40,000 Afghan refugees to be admitted. We now have a program with regard to uh, fast-tracking Uyghurs, uh, given what is happening and has been happening and has been ignored uh, with respect to the mass atrocities which effectively constitute uh, a genocide in uh, the Xinjiang uh, region of China. I use these just as illustrations of, of two things. Number one, uh, I think we've learned from our historical uh, failure 
with respect to uh, the non-admission of Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. And I think secondly, that Canada has been the beneficiary of uh, this immigration. And in fact, it has added to uh, the diversity uh, uh, of the Canadian experience and indeed has actually assisted us uh, economically and the like. So I'm pleased about the turnaround with regard to immigration and rescue. I still think we need to do more, but it is dramatically different from the terrible legacy uh, that we had inherited uh, with respect uh, to the Holocaust. And I think in terms of what Alicia said, I fully support uh, Elie Wiesel's call to action to intervene. It was his voice that was so important and compelling <laughs> to, start, uh, to Syria when in fact uh, Obama's red line at the time became in effect a pink advisory and so on. I think you know we have been very uh, indifferent to what has been happening in a number of situations of mass atrocities globally. I'll just close just for the taking the Ukraine, for example, because uh, what had been going on in the, uh, what has been happening in the Ukraine, one has to see it in, in terms of the fact that when Putin went into Chechnya, the world remained silent and indifferent. When he invaded Georgia, the same thing. When he annexed the Crimea, the same thing. When he was engaged in brutality in Syria, same thing. When he was engaged in massive domestic, same. And so it was understandable from Putin's point of view for him to think, well, you know, the world didn't do anything when I went into Chechnya and Georgia and Crimea, and Syria, etc. Why should they care if I go into Ukraine, which belongs to me anyway, which is not an independent country, which I need to denazify, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all that uh, uh, distortion and and the like. So the indifference and inaction with respect to the Ukraine led to what is happening. Uh, indifference and action, Putin's other actions led to what is now happening in the Ukraine. Happily, that became not happen, but at least became a wake-up call. And the world did react in terms of military, economic, humanitarian uh, support and the like. But the dangers of our indifference and inaction led us to Ukraine. Thank you. We have one from online, and then um, we'll, I have a, one or two more, and then I'm gonna turn it back to you all, so. Okay, thanks, Randy. So a question from Lori Cohen. Aside from Israel's it's, uh, stability, is there a specific human rights issue right now in the world that you are most concerned about? Thank you, Lori. I'm, I'm happy to go first and, and you know, no surprise, Erwin has already mentioned it, but the fact that, you know, one million Muslims are behind, you know, barbed wire in concentration camps in, you know, in China is unbelievable on that scale that this is happening. And look, Thank God the Biden administration has actually, you know, been doing things. The Biden administration has been, you know, putting out sanctions. The, the Biden administration has been uh, putting through legislation that makes it very clear how intolerable this is. And it's very hard when you have a superpower doing it. It's much easier when you have an emerging power that you can fight with. But China is probably our biggest competitor on the national stage right now. And what they have done, you know, arresting people for thought crimes, uh, putting them behind bars simply because of their ethnicity or their faith, that this is happening on this kind of scale is absolutely intolerable. And it's one of the reasons that um, the foundation that lives in my father's name, the Elie Wiesel Foundation, you know, one of the very few public things we've done over the last year is to take out an ad in the New York Times at the time of the Beijing Olympics, uh, calling for a boycott if China would not stop its treatment of the uh, of the Uyghurs. Thanks, Alicia. Professor? I, I, I certainly uh, share that. I think sometimes we, we ignore uh, the manner in which uh, Xi Jinping's China has targeted what uh, he has called the five sins, which manifested itself in mass atrocities uh, that constitute acts of genocide regarding the Uyghurs. Our Wallenberg Center produced a report detailing and documenting uh, the, uh, the fact of that genocide, but there have been also the assault on uh, the democracy movement, democracy itself in, in Hong Kong. There have been the persecution and prosecution of the Falun Gong. There have been the repression of Tibet and the menacing of Taiwan, all the five sins, so to speak, that uh, Xi Jinping has, has targeted. And what is not as well known is that China jails more journalists than any other uh, country in the world. And there's a massive you know, surveillance state that has been put into place. So I, I think that is a, 
a human rights issue highlighted by uh, the, the, the Uyghur mass atrocities that we need to uh, turn our attention. I commend the Biden administration for taking the steps that it has taken. Thank you both. So back in August 2017, there was a Unite the Right rally of white supremacists, white nationalists, neo-Nazis, fellow travelers in Charlottesville, Virginia. And although the reason for the gathering was the removal of statues of Confederates, there was film footage of young men shouting blood and soil and the Jews will not replace us. And I'm wondering, and then of course we had the attack from the synagogues and Pittsburgh and Poe and Moore and seeing that guy in the Camp Auschwitz shirt in the Capitol building on January 6th. And so we know that there's this, this historic rise in anti-Semitism. And I am wondering what you're thinking about it and also your personal experiences with anti-Semitism because there's the big stuff that I think keeps us up at night. And then there's the stuff where our kids come home from school and say, so-and-so said this, or this happened. And I'm wondering what your, um, what your experiences are, what your thoughts and feelings are about this rise in anti-Semitism and personal experiences. Listen, you have to remember, we are hated from both the right and from the left for absolutely contradictory reasons. The right wing, hate Jews because we are the puppet masters who have brought down the white man and brought up, in some sense, helped lift through the civil rights movement, people of color and other minorities. And we are hated for that. On the other hand, we are hated from the far left because we are colonizers, because we are white appearing, uh, because we are part of the problem keeping minorities down. These two things are 100% incompatible and it is terribly distressing to me to hear this, you know, Jews will not replace us that we heard in Charlottesville. But I would say that in general, the press spends more time on that flavor of anti-Semitism than it does on the anti-Semitism that masks itself as anti-Zionism, which occurs on the left, where you will hear said, you know, on a big megaphone, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And by the way, like, for those of us who are familiar with the history of Nazi Germany and the phrase Judenrein, you know, when we hear that a land will be free in a place where Jews are living, unfortunately, we know what that means. And I think that we're in a world right now where it is much easier for an overall left trending press to say anti-Semitism is that thing over there on the right. And by the way, you then will see the right-wing publications look at what's going on, on the left and say, no, 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 anti-Semitism is that thing over there. The truth is they're both real. They're both there. And when a guy like Kanye West goes completely off the reservation and is effectively, you know, uh, is effectively taken off the, you know, uh, taken off the, the line by Adidas, you know, Adidas has no problem then, you know, within two days later, uh, rolling out Bella Hadid's new fashion line, who has been seen and videoed, you know, saying these very same statements from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So I think we're grappling with it. I think that that's the good news, how we grapple with it and whether we get to the right place. I think history has not uh, been favorable to us, but hopefully things will continue to improve. Erwin, what do you think? Well, I, I share your, your approach, at least in terms of the right-left uh, configuration. Let, let me also share just some of the findings. I'm just completing my second year now as a special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. And in fact, 2021 uh, was the year for the most alarming rise in anti-Semitism. The audits, whether it be by ADL in the U.S. or League for Human Rights of Neighbors in Canada and elsewhere, uh, showed uh, that it was the highest level of incidences of anti-Semitism in the 40 plus years that ADL or in Canada we've been auditing anti-Semitism. But uh, what has been concerning me has been not only the alarming rise in anti-Semitism, which included in it the alarming rise in hate crimes and sundry uh, hate speech, but a number of other uh, dynamics. The first is, and this was triggered also by what you were mentioning, Alicia, that I think we have to uh, revisit our paradigm of combating anti-Semitism from the far right to far left radical Islam. What, what has concerned me and you reference this uh, as, as well, what's been concerning me has been what I would call the increasing mainstreaming, normalizing, legitimation 
of anti-Semitism in the political culture, the popular culture, the campus culture, the, the sports culture, the media, culture, and, and the absence of, of outrage, uh, sometimes underpinned as well here too by indifference and inaction. The second has been the, the globalization factor, not only the alarming rise of anti-Semitism globally, but the interaction of that globalization. For example, uh, during the Hamas war, May 2021, which itself was a tipping point for, for anti-Semitism, you had convoys going through the streets of the UK saying, F the Jews will rape your daughters. You had similarly convoys then going through the streets of Toronto saying the same thing. So it was not only a, an interconnection of anti-Semitism, but almost an orchestrated character to it. The third was what I would call the marginalization of anti-Semitism. We're involved uh, here in Canada, uh, U.S., you know, in, in combating systemic racism against Indigenous people, Blacks and people of color, Asian, uh, Canadians, mother, and the, but what I have found that in government education and training programs and outside government, the combating of anti-Semitism is marginalized in those training programs. In the call to action that was issued by the, uh, in Canada, the clerk of the Privy Council a year ago to combat all these systemic racisms, which we all welcomed, there was no reference uh, to anti-Semitism. And this leads me to the next and moving to the close, the actual laundering of anti-Semitism under the very cover of anti-racism. And so you have, particularly with respect to uh, on the campus culture, where we had you know, uh, Jewish students saying that those were, let's say, progressive Jewish students, saying that they're being forced to choose between their uh, Jewish identity and acceptability into the campus culture, that they're caught in a pincer movement where they're held out as being representatives of the white privilege, if not supremacist movement, and acting as apologists for the white apartheid state of Israel. I think those are the things that I find very disconcerting, this actual laundering of anti-Semitism under the very cover of anti-racism, uh, and where it metastasizes to the laundering of that anti-Semitism under the protective cover of the UN, the authority of international law, the culture of human rights, and the like. That makes a real a challenge, particularly for those in the uh, campus culture. All right, so I did also ask whether you've experienced anti-Semitism or you know, a close family member, and I'm wondering whether you're willing to answer that. I, uh, I remember being in a loft at a party in London, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, where, um, where I was, it was 20 years ago, oh my God, I have no sense of time. I must have been a young man. Um, and I was, I was talking to a young woman and this big Russian guy, you know, cross around his neck came up and, uh, started talking. He's like, why in the world would you be talking to this little Jew? You know, do you want a little Jew in you too? Is that what you want? And like, I remember it started getting pretty aggressive. Uh, it was de-escalated. Um, but I definitely have had moments like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's real. It's real. Thank you, Alicia. Professor. Yeah, I, I grew up in Montreal where you had a kind of tribal configuration, you know, uh, people living both demographically and otherwise Protestant, Catholics and Jews. And sometimes uh, there were crossovers. And I recall, you know, uh, some occasions in, in which we were both taunted and targeted as Jews, you know, the dirty Jew. Um, and then uh, the more benign uh, type of anti-Semitism uh, in quotas. Uh, my father was a victim of those quotas. He wanted and. His lifelong dream was to be a doctor, but he got caught up in that quota and was never able to become a doctor. He did become a lawyer, but I always, you know, heard about the dream. And I still remember, you know, early in, uh, in my childhood, you know, seeing signs, you know, no Jews or dogs welcome here. Astonishing as it may sound, but, you know, th th those are moments of remembrance. At the same time, uh, they were more isolated events. I think what the Jewish students are experiencing today uh, in terms of their targeting is in a, in a way uh, much more serious because it's more institutionalized and it's become more mainstream, as, as I said, and it has a kind of silencing effect on, on their own uh, speech and maybe their identity. So I think I, you know, experienced some uh, incidences here and there, but it did not have that kind of ongoing, you know, psychological uh, fallout, etc. I think today for the students, it's much worse. And not just the students, this is the first time, and I've been at ADL for 18 years, where I've heard Jewish people say that they don't tell people their last names if they can avoid it. 
I had never heard that before this year. So I would agree with you about that silencing and the concern of it. Thank you. I want to open it up to the group again for any questions right here. Husband, and it's an honor to, to uh, address this, this panel. The, the great Elie Wiesel, may his memory always be a blessing, had brothers and sisters in rhetorical and in ethical arms in the civil rights movement, uh, Black and Hispanic voices, a lot of Black voices in particular. It seems now, and it just came up in the last couple of questions, that there's a very serious rift between this uh, civil rights activists and, and folks concerned with racism and anti-Semitism between those communities. I live in New York. I see it all the time in Brooklyn, for example. And earlier, my uncle referred to the Kyrie Irving and Kanye West dynamics. It, it seems to me, and I, I'd like to hear your views, that the, the key uh, to, uh, if not eradication, abatement of anti-Semitism and racism is, an, is a return to some form of alliance. Um, between communities that suffer similar types of indignation and um, and, uh, and 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 racism and degradation, is that is is the water completely under the bridge here? Can those relationships be repaired, uh, in your view? And what's the secret uh, to to doing that? What how do we how do we kind of unlock that lock? Listen, you know, I've I've gosh, Arne, you want to go first on this one? I've taken a lot of the curveballs first. Such a hard question. <laughs> yeah, the, I think that the, here, Ellie also was not only an educator, uh, but a practitioner of, of, of allyship. And I know, you know, in our Raw Wallenberg Center, we've been in, inspired uh, by those uh, teachings and experience, and we've sought to do the same thing as we're meeting. Uh, we are uh, signing a memorandum of uh, cooperation uh, with the uh, Black North, with the Black community, uh, so that we can have more uh, of a Jewish-Black alliance rather than the kind of situation that has been developing more in the States and in Canada, but still in, in, in terms of uh, an adversariness rather than uh, coming together. I also find that you know when we talk about uh, hate speech online, which is the real dangerous weaponization of anti-Semitism, <laughs> that we have you know common cause here because that hate speech online you know targets uh, minorities and therefore it behooves minorities to come together uh, to develop a strategy uh, with respect to combating this hate speech online whether it be in terms of holding the social media companies accountable uh, the necessary legislative initiatives and and the like so i do think that in a world in which uh, we are seeing uh, discrimination across all sectors and more than that uh, we're, we're, we're in kind of historical inflection point of a resurgent global authoritarianism, a backsliding of democracies and assault on the rules-based international order where we see political prisoners as a looking glass. Uh, we need to uh, come together on this. And, you know, uh, Elie Wiesel was, was such a great advocate of, uh, and defense of, uh, defender of political prisoners. I think we we patented that with regard to the struggle for Soviet Jewry. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about intersectionality and where we're on the wrong side of intersectionality and the dynamics of repression. But if we think about it, and under Ellie's leadership, we patented intersectionality in the best sense. We had at the, at the time, you know, parliamentarians for Soviet Jewry, lawyers for Soviet Jewry, women for Soviet Jewry, students for Soviet Jewry, scientists for Soviet This was a real intersectional a movement and a critical mass of advocacy. And Ellie patented also defending prisoners of conscience and political prisoners and the movement with regard to prisoners of Zion of which uh, Natan Sharansky became expression and example. I think we need to go and try to go back to uh, engaging, and though it's much more difficult I have to say, but, but uh, it was Ellie's teachings and practice in terms of going back and uh, working in common cause on behalf of political prisoners. That's one of the main things we're doing in the Wallenberg Center. And we've taken up major political prisoners and creating alliances in that regard. I, I, have, I have two, first of all, I agree 100% with the way Erwin presents all that. I, I would add maybe two more thoughts. The first thought is when you start thinking about political allyship, 
a lot of it has to do with us, them, who's trying to do what, whether it's taxes or school zoning um, or various political favors that need to be distributed around in certain ways. But I want to I want to say that maybe there's a deeper point of unity between these different communities, which is we all right now, I think, are at this moment in time where our you know, kids are losing their souls to screens. Gosh, we, we ourselves are losing our souls to screens. We're searching for meaning. Our family structure is under attack in so many different ways. And I wonder whether, you know, the, the, the church, which has always been such a unifying force in the family lives of minorities, and the synagogue, which was a unifying force, and the faith, which was a unifying force for the Jewish people, we're both fighting a rear guard battle in some sense against assimilation, against a distance from spiritual meaning and a sense of a higher purpose that brings families together, that says the world is not all relative. There is a standard of higher values that even if we can't know it perfectly, we should always be striving to know better and to do better. And is that the thing that maybe, you know, brings us together is, a, is, that, is that shared search for meaning which is on a completely different axis than the political. And the second point that I'd wanna raise when we think about my father's legacy in the modern political environment, again, not thinking about any particular pair of allies or political opponents. One of the things that I think most gets under my skin when I hear my father reduced to a soundbite is I often hear my father reduced to the quote that you know the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Uh, silence is the enemy, silence enables the oppressor. But I look at the world in which we live in today in 21st century political America, and I don't think that we are in any way suffering from uh, silence. Everybody is screaming. We're all screaming at each other. And my father actually was, aside from that quote in the political context in which it's absolutely appropriate, my father in a more spiritual sense was also a big advocate of the principle of silence. And I, I wonder whether or not wherever we stand within the community, a little bit more silence, a little bit more listening, a little bit more humility of not assuming that we always have some rejoinder to come back with to express our point of view. Uh, I wonder whether that isn't part of the solution. Thank you so much, both of you. Question in the back. It's, it's uh, 77 years since the end of World War II. And I am proud to of all the things that ADL and similar organizations have done in the 1960s were part of the civil rights movement. Rabbi Joshua Herschel was arm in arm with Martin Luther King, but that's 50 plus years ago. Is it time to think about doing something completely different than what we've been doing? Are we in, you know, the old definition of insanity of uh, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different solution. Uh, do we have to just take a completely different look at what we are, we have been doing out of the best interests of our hearts and parts of the world, but find something different, a different way? Let's see. All right. What do you think, Professor and Alicia? Look, I'm, I'm a big fan of humility, right? I, I don't claim to know what that thing is. So... Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a very short example. So it's really only last year that my mother asked me to take over the Ellie Wiesel Foundation. And the very first thing that we decided to do is pivot towards becoming a grant making organization. And we decided that we would set targets and goals and aspirations. And then we would effectively do something that I think is one of the most powerful tools we have to come up with new ideas, which is to crowdsource. So we are crowdsourcing the question on what to do about the Uyghur situation. And we put out in, you know, in e-Jewish philanthropy and other publications, we're putting out advertisements saying that we are prepared to make grants, but we need the best ideas that people can bring to us on how to actually achieve change because we know we're not smart enough to just have them on our own. So I like the direction that your question comes from. Uh, and I think that there are many smart voices and minds and one of the best things about technology and the connectedness of the world is maybe it's easier for good ideas to be surfaced and we should take advantage of that in the modern world. I, I'm uh, hesitant to speak about anything that relates to uh, the importance of what Alicia just mentioned because I'm one of those who is technically illiterate. I know of its importance, but I'm not one who can in, engage effectively in it. 
uh, I do like Alicia's guidance with regard to um, reminding us of the need for uh, humility. And I think that is something that uh, Ellie also uh, practiced. And that is something that we can take uh, to heart. Uh, we're also living in, I say this more in terms of the US and Canada, but you know, what happens in the US has followed for Canada. I'm worried about what I see as an increasing, you know, polarizing uh, populist post-truth uh, universe. And I, in that sense, I think the role of education uh, becomes uh, crucial. And I think when we educate, for example, with regard to anti-Semitism or educating both with regard to the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, we're really educating uh, for uh, democracy and civility. But is not always appreciated is that anti-Semitism is toxic to democracies. It's a threat to our common uh, humanity. What we've said before about beginning with Jews doesn't end with Jews. Uh, it's a lesson that we sometimes rhetorically repeat, but have not internally uh, acted upon. And so I, I think what's at stake when we speak about these issues and in terms of battling indifference, what is at stake is really our common humanity and our shared future. And that's why in that sense, uh, Holocaust education, education about anti-Semitism, uh, understanding this within the framework of the universality of human rights and human dignity uh, becomes so important. Thank you, Professor. You actually anticipated my last question. So you already answered it, but what is your perspective on Holocaust education today, Alicia? And do you believe, like Professor Kotler, that it can be a tool to challenge indifference? So since I suspect this is my last uh, statement in this session, I'm also going to make sort of a quick closing remark, which is thank you, Randy, for everything that you do. My father was blessed to be a good friend of Abe Foxman's. I'm blessed to be a friend of Jonathan Greenblatt's. Uh, what the ADL does every day is so critical and important. And I really appreciate that you are here to represent uh, the organization today in this. It's, it's a critical part of everything that I think we need to do. Um, for me, I would say the following about Holocaust education. Holocaust education is all about the teacher, I think, and a little bit less about the curriculum. And I know that that's controversial because so many great minds put so much thought into the curriculum. And actually, the only reason I can say that is because there are so many amazing groups like Facing History that have really, really sharpened the tools and made them available. But the difference between reading night with a teacher who sits there and grills you on the stylistic devices that Wiesel uses. And believe it or not, I have heard students say that this is the sort of thing their teacher asks them about versus the teacher who says, let's talk about how this makes you feel. What do you think? And gets to the content rather than the technicalities of the English language. With one teacher, you're gonna have one sort of an experience or you'll be pushed in a certain direction. With the other, another vista opens for you. So I think it all comes down to the teachers and where they come from in this process. But the, the most important thing that I think I'd wanna convey about my father within the lens of Holocaust education is, my father did a lot for us to recognize the evils of the Holocaust, but at a much deeper level, who he was, was an expression of the people who were wiped out. And very specifically, what was my father's life before the war? And what part of the Jewish people was he part of? He was a chassid. He was a chassid. And the way that one acts as a chassid is, is completely linked to the way that my father treated people. And I like to think that in Judaism, we have something called a Torah shabichtav. We have a written Torah. And then we have the Torah shabalpeh, the oral tradition. And for those who want to know my father through his works, his writings are there to be taken. Thank God. There's enough books, enough speeches. We can find out what he thought on any given topic. But the secret to the man who was my father was the oral tradition, which is how he treated people and how he comported himself. If you want to know the secret message that my father carried from the flames of the Holocaust, from his ancestors and continued to pass on to everyone that he had the pleasure to meet in person, it was those secrets of how to treat people and how to comport oneself, because that's who he was. Thank you so much. And what a powerful way for you to end um, your 
your remarks to us. Professor Copper, do you want to have some last words too? Only that we should just remember these last words of uh, Alicia. And, <laughs> and you would know. Any, any, said, words that I would add, any, any words that I would add would detract. I regarded Ellie uh, as Alicia put it as a chassid, as really a lamed vavnik for his time and, and all times. And that's how we should remember him and do our best to try to give expression to his legacy in our daily ma'asim tovim. Erwin, and I have to just say one more thing. I'm sorry to jump in, but I was going through some documents preparing for this, and I found uh, a number of files with your name, and you were clearly such a dear friend of my father's. But the best was like, he had a file that said basically, in case of emergency, meaning an ethical emergency, a world emergency, who is he going to call? And there was a list of six or seven people. And Erwin, your name is right there on the top of the list. So I wanted to share that with you. What an honor for all of us, I think, to have spent this time with you.